Okay, so I'm really pleased to welcome Dr Anne Sved-Williams to the stage. Um, Anne is going to speak about working with mentally ill mothers and their infants. She's making her way through. Anne is a perinatal infant psychiatrist and for 24 years has been the medical unit head of Helen Mayo House, which is the mother infant public mental health public inpatient unit in Adelaide. She's a clinical senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide and Anne is very, very well known. Um, many of us have had contact with her over the years and we've certainly had a number of clients who have been in Helen Mayo House. So look forward to hearing from Anne. Thank you. I'll change it on both places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hello everybody, and it's delightful to be here. And um, I realised as I was coming here, I don't know that much about mine, so I thought, well, it's a good opportunity. That's what conferences are for, is sort of like for communication both ways. So I thought it would be good, I mean, there's too many of you obviously to introduce yourselves by hand, but I gather that a lot of you would have, I was wondering what your basic, or your, like, your qualifications are. So it's a certificate in, a, a certificate for in mental health, is that right? So could you put up your hands if that's what you've got? So the basic? So some of you have that. What about like a trained mental health, mental health nurse? Some of you have got that. And social work, is that a qualification? So lots of you have got social work. And what else? Psychology. Some psychologists as well. Are there, and there are any other disciplines? Disability studies. Good, thank you. Patient therapist, psychiatrist, that's Moira. <laughs> Me. <laughs> um, so that's good to know because I really, truthfully, I thought that, uh, that wasn't, I really wasn't sure about it. And so um, because of that, it was sort of like, so where do I start this? What will I talk about today? And I think I, this is all a bit tricky because I have to click in two places. Oh, I can sort of see, okay. Um, so this is what I thought, oops, what I'd talk about today um, is uh, maternal mental illness and because of the area in which I work, Helen Mayo House, and just a very brief word about that, it's a six bed unit, it belongs to the Women's and Children's uh, Health Network, um, but it's based on the Glenside campus. Six bed means that we have six mothers, six babies, sometimes two or three extra toddlers as well, and sometimes dads, so we can have up to 20 people there. The waiting list is long. We should be larger than we are. I've waged unsuccessful campaigns to take it further than that, and I've been told it's to be, well, if they've already put the foundations down, they're re we're rebuilding, at, it is being rebuilt at Glenside, and our new facility will be ready in about 12 months' time from now. Unfortunately, the same size as what it is, because we'd love to be larger. Um, so that's, um, that's my base, and so I tend to often think about mental illness as the severe end, but I'm sure that a lot of you will find problems that are much more manageable than we find with the very severe end of the range. I'm going to talk briefly um, about what problems have caused and then in this half hour, magically, I'm going to tell you how you can cure all of these problems because <laughs> <laughs> all the generations that have produced these problems will all fix them in the next 27 minutes. So because I wasn't certain of exactly what um, discipline you come from, I thought I'd make sure that we're talking from the same base. So I thought I'd talk um, the axial diagnoses. That is that next slide. Gosh, it's hard to remember two places. Oh, go forward. Um, so, um, axis one diagnosis, of course, is what most of us mean by um, severe mental um, illness. It's hard not to get that sort of rather funny phrase that we find more and more people using. We used to have mental illness and then we had mental health because mental illness wasn't very nice to have. And so now we've got a mental health illness, which of course is rather a kind of <laughs> strange thing. But I've almost caught myself saying mental health illness, you know, because it's like, oh, we can't stigmatise people by having a mental illness, can we? We can't actually put on the table what it is more about putting things on the table in a while. So of course what we mean by the AXIS-1 diagnoses are those kind of classic diagnoses like bipolar mood disorder or schizophrenia or um, depression. Um, and then I thought, well, if we, we're to embed that, we need to understand sort of like where do we think about these? How do I think about or how do we at Helen Mayo House think about these? And it's terribly important to think about it with the range, the whole range, because when it comes to parenting, it's often not the Axis I psychiatric diagnosis that's particularly at issue, but the other issues surrounding it, such as the personality disorder, which I'm going to talk more about, uh, the physical health of the mother, although generally that's, you know, generally as a kind of broad brush 
rush because these are young women, the physical health is not hugely a con of great concern. Of course, we need to know what's happening there, but generally our, women, our mums are reasonably physically healthy um, for the stressors, you know, like what's happening in their wider life. And obviously, there are usually enormous or frequently enormous pressures, money, finances, marital, friendship, uh, extended family problems, and then what is the level of functioning, because that's, of course, what makes an impact for the infant. So I thought then I'll talk some generalities, not that this talk isn't all generalities. It's terribly important to understand that all women are doing the best they can as mothers. And so one of the reasons that I've had most of my psychiatric career working in this area is because I love it. I love working with mothers and babies, not just because the babies are there and they're sometimes gorgeous to cuddle, you know, and we've all got our favourites in Helen Mayo, like I'll take this one home or that one, um, but also because the work that we're doing tries to cut across the, the, um, the weight that women bear of the generations prior to them, what's happened in their own families of origin and how they brought that into themselves and how they're parenting and trying to help them change at a time that they're really motivated to change is very exciting. And so one of the best times to do work is when women have uh, are their first, when they're first time parents. I couldn't do this work for myself, they'll say, but now I've got a baby, I want things to be different from how I was brought up, or I know I've lived with shit all of my life, I don't want that to impact on my infant. And so it's a great time to kind of pull that motivation and get um, try to help these women make change. So women, for instance, will give up smoking. They don't all, but a lot of women will give up smoking when they're pregnant. They'll give up alcohol when they're pregnant. They'll change their substance abuse. Unfortunately, some of them don't can't do it with the baby inside, for those women who aren't very reflective, they can't understand that infant, the fetus inside, as a person separate to themselves. So they will only start to make those changes when they're a postnatal. We've had a couple of women coming through recently who've had a lot of substance abuse in pregnancy when it's more likely to be, in a way, directly impactful on the baby, but they've decided once this new baby's in front of them and the baby's low birth weight, and they've understood that the baby's low birth weight because of the substance abuse in pregnancy, they're horrified. Have I done that to my baby? I really want to make some changes. And whilst we would have preferred that they had that aha experience nine months earlier or 10 months earlier, nevertheless, it's a lot better time than you know 18 years down the track when they've got an out of control teenager. So um, we understand understand that most of the, these women want to do the best. We often see parenting which isn't very good, um, but we know that they're doing the best that they can and we're trying to at least get them to adequate, to good enough. Is when There is no such thing as perfect parenting, so we're always trying to get them to good enough. And again, I haven't really mentioned in this talk, but sometimes, of course, when they're not good enough, I assume you're all mandated notifiers. And so um, Families SA, they, we work in partnership with them very closely because we must, we must constantly bear in mind child protection issues when we're working in this area. Next thing to say, though, following on from that all women are doing the best they can, although the mental illness may affect their parenting, many offspring of women um, who have severe mental illness actually are doing a good job. So we mustn't think that because the women are compromised, both with their mental illness and with their parenting style, but particularly just by the mental illness, that they're not good enough mothers, because many of them are, and we have to promote that. And of course, you're all into recovery models, so you'll well understand the narrative of the positive rather than just focusing on the problems. And overall, the outcomes are related to a lot of problems, not just to the mental illness. So rarely does a mental illness, just the mental illness in its own right, actually affect the outcome. So the way that I like to think about that is um, um, according to um, Arnold Samaroff, and he did a longitudinal study um, a number of years ago. He followed up kids. He looked at a number of factors, um, 10 of them, which are listed here, because poor, undereducated and single that are up there are actually three factors. So it looks like a list of eight, but really it's 10, trust me. So he looked at these 10 factors and he followed these kids up first to the age of four and he's actually followed this whole cohort through to a well into adult life. And what he's found is that it's the combination of maternal mental illness, which is factor one, with all of these other nine factors, which actually produces troubled outcomes, which are quite measurable. So by the time the child is aged four, if there are four or more of these factors for each factor over number four, so it's the rule of fours, I usually go by the rule of threes, but this one's a rule of fours, for each factor over number four, 
the infant's IQ at the age of four or the child, small child's IQ is reduced by four points. So in Helen Mayo House, it's not uncommon for us to see women who might have seven of these factors. And my arithmetic, I come from a mathematical family, so we're good at that. So seven from four is three, and three times four is 12. So if that child would have had an IQ of 100, which is the average, instead that child's IQ at the age of four is reduced to 88, which is very, very substantial in that child's longitudinal life. As you can tell, it will have enormous impacts on that child's ability um, to learn. So I'm not going to talk about all of those. You can see they're sort of in groups, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about them in groups. The first four are about the mother and what's directly going on in her life. So as well as that illness diagnosis, uh, which like an axis one diagnosis and possibly some anxiety as well, she doesn't feel positive towards her infant and that's likely to come from her personality and then the next factor of course also comes from her personality or from the patterns of upbringing that happened to her when she was young and that's maternal rigidity. Now Samarov talked about it as maternal rigidity. The way that the literature is going in infant mental health for those of you who read it, the principal thing that we're looking for in mothers to see whether they can parent better than their parents parented them is have, are they reflective? Can they understand what happened in their own childhood, what the qualities were of the life that they had there that were problematic to them, why their parents might have behaved as they had, and therefore to understand how that's affected them in their adult life and how they might parent differently. And so m maternal rigidity is either, this is the way my mother did it, so that's what I'm going to do, Unfortunately, when they hated what they happened, happened in their childhood, it's sometimes the exact opposite. And the exact opposite is not necessarily very good. So an example of that is my mother never my mother dumped me all of the time. She never wanted me around. I will never leave my child. Now, on the surface of it, that sounds brilliant, doesn't it? But often what it means is, I will never leave my child physically. Now, often mums who've had the sort of parenting that this mother I'm talking about has had, have, haven't had good quality emotionally. So they're with their, mother, their child physically, but they're not with their child emotionally. So they might be sitting outside smoking all the time. So the baby's kind of there, but the baby's needs are not being met. There's very poor maternal infant interaction, perhaps, and we think those kids might be better in childcare a lot of the time, having someone actually queuing into where that infant's coming from. So we say to that mum, what about your baby going into childcare several days a week? Nope, I won't do it. My mother abandoned me, and I'll, that will be abandoning my child. So in that way, maternal rigidity, or retranslated in sort of modern speakers, maternal lack of reflective capacity, is really one of the factors as well. Now the next three factors I've talked about, they're the um, psychosocial factors. The next one is terribly important because it's the easiest one to actually change. Too many children in the house, so the reason I've written contraception there is that um, that's the one factor that we just about bludgeon our patients into. No woman leaves Helen Mayo House without a Mirena, you know, an intrauterine device. I mean, that's, of course, not quite true. That's our rigidity. And it does turn out that Mirenas, because they're progesterone-based, can actually change mood. So we're, we've become a little bit more iffy about Mirena, but there are contraception, contraceptive choices that women can make. And we know that if a woman's struggling with her own mental health and a child, having more children isn't good timing. Maybe down the track, but not right now. So contraception is one of the best interventions we do. Obviously, if you've had a lot of those other things happening, you're likely to have stressful life events. And of course, coming from a disadvantaged minority group and in our society, who are the, what are they likely to be? What culture? Aboriginal, yes, unfortunately and sadly the most disadvantaged minority group here, but there are plenty of migrant groups as well who certainly are struggling. So we try to change what we can of those. So just a sort of brief overview about how particular illnesses do affect particular mothers. The first one's bipolar mood disorder, and I'll come back to depression in a minute um, as to what the effects of depression might be. When a mother's manic, she is sometimes so obsessed, well, she's so delusional, possibly, or so unwell she can't concentrate, so her infant's needs aren't that well met. By and large, mothers with a bipolar mood disorder, and this is a high generalisation, the most severe form of bipolar mood disorder that we see um, postnatally is a purple psychosis, which is that severe form of psychotic illness that happens in the immediate postnatal period, probably triggered, almost certainly triggered by the 
um, changes, the hor substantial hormonal changes that happen as the placenta passes out of the body. Suddenly the women's, woman's estrogen and progesterone drops dramatically and um, the um, woman who has a vulnerable brain genetically becomes unwell, psychotic within days and they can be very, very unwell for many, many weeks. Um, it's the most severe illness that we have to contend with often. But if the baby's protected and we make sure that the delusions aren't about the mother getting rid of this baby because it's, she might delusionally believe, for instance, she's had a damaged child, those infants, by and large, grow up to have healthy outcomes provided the woman's compliant with treatment and so on. And just in general, if you want some, and I'm sure you work widely with carers, recently we've had put on our web website um, a fantastic brochure, brochure written by a man called Craig Allett, who is Canberra-based, and um, his wife had a purple psychosis, and she actually killed herself a few months postnatally, and is part of his healing process. He's now a single parent, and he contacted me and asked if he could put this um, carer brochure on his website. It's the best brochure I've ever read for carers. It's written around purple psychosis, but if you want a brochure that's actually around what carers could think about um, uh, caring for their partners, it's actually a fantastic brochure. It's available from Craig directly as a booklet, but it's available on our website, and if you can't um, get all of that down, just Google Helen Mayo House and it'll be led to that brochure. So that's uh, bipolar mood disorder. So then moving on to schizophrenia, and of course that's 1% uh, of the population have schizophrenia. And so we don't actually, we see less than 1% of our mothers actually have schizophrenia, and that's because the mental health teams are very good at in introducing their patients to contraception. And I have to say that we think this is a wonderful idea because schizophrenia is um, the illness that par excellence interferes dramatically with parenting, and about 50% of mothers with schizophrenia at least will lose their babies, and their children have a high genetic chance of um, developing um, schizophrenia schizophrenia themselves, particularly if the other parent, which commonly happens, has another mental illness. So cruel though it seems, sometimes unkind, because we understand that people have a right to a life, all of that, and the, the same perhaps life choices that all the rest of us have, we actually sometimes think it's much less cruel to not have that baby in the first place than to have that child removed appropriately by child protection services. So it's highly unlikely that women will make a go of parenting unless they're surrounded by a very good family, extended family system of care, and because of the nature of the illness, um, that's actually very unusual and unfortunately again in our culture most women who are have a schizophrenic illness, not all but a large percentage of them also substantial substance users and so the combinations are pretty poor package for parenting. So they're generalisations as is all of my talk today, um, I just don't have time to take that any further. Um, so um, the outcomes for depression, what happens with mothers who are depressed, and of course this could be major depression like the severe end of it or the dysthymic disorder which is more the chronic grumbling depressions. Um, it depends on the type of depression that the mother has. So some mothers have that avoidant, they're depressed, they're withdrawn and listless and so on. And those mothers are sometimes avoidant with their babies, they just don't have the energy to do it. And unfortunately, therefore, they are infants, they will develop an avoidant attachment pattern with their infants. And there's some very good work that's been done in the recent past by an American called Carlin Lyons Ruth. And her work clearly shows that the worst outcome for infants is where the mothers are avoidant long term. So a mum's depression will interfere with her parenting, but it's actually worse for her baby than when she's avoidant than if she's intrusive. And that's the other pattern, as I've already mentioned and I must underline, having depression in and of itself doesn't mean you're going to have a bad outcome. So I'm talking about when there are problems. It could be either too little parenting, which is the avoidant, or sometimes too much. So sometimes when women have that more agitated depression and they're kind of driven to do things, and that some women are absolutely wonderful in trying to give their babies the best and they work almost too hard, they have sometimes perfectionistic personalities, they work too hard to give their babies too much and they become quite intrusive with their babies, which also isn't that good. Um, but um, that is probably preferable as a sort of generalisation to avoidance. So that's the sort of broad brush look at the AXIS-1 diagnoses. Let's move on to AXIS-2 diagnoses. And of course by that, the main thing that I'm meaning 
Um, generally, a personality disorder is when people have kind of like disruptive traits that allow them that don't allow them to live quite as well as other people in the in the usual world because there's something in their personality which so structures their daily life that it makes interactions with the rest of the world quite compromised. And in particular, we're all all of us who work in this field are very focused on borderline personality disorder. Now, this is a condition in which, as you can see, the women have, and I'm sure you know, profound difficulties with interpersonal relationships, and that includes living with themselves, and therefore, of course, living with a baby, and the crying baby can trigger off a mass of terrible mass of things happening in women's head. And so these women who are prone to mood disturbances and a fragile self, sense of self preoccupy us a lot of the time in Helen Mayo House. Now, borderline personality disorder is a condition that is highly stigmatised in mental health services. And in the last few years, we've certainly grown used to dealing with um, this situation in a very different way. We've become very open if we're certain that that's what we're dealing with. I take out my DSM-4 book and I have a discussion with the patient and I say, um, here's a condition called borderline personality disorder and the patients generally don't have the stigma, stigmatised view of it that I might have or might have had. And so I take my DSM-4 out and I say to the woman, do you think that your moods change quickly? And they say yes. And they, I say, do you think you've got a poor sense of who you are? And they say yes. So we just go through it. I show them the pages. I don't make a secret of it. And we usually, we will always, I've never had that discussion yet with a woman where she hasn't said, yes, that's me, that fits for me exactly, what is it, tell me all about it. And the reason that we do it these days like that is because the very good treatments are emerging, like dialectic behaviour therapy. There's not enough of them around, but those women who we can, we're actively referring to uh, various groups and other treatments. There's also um, the mentalisation based treatments, but there's not enough of people doing that at the moment either. Um, and by and large, what we do know with the Access 2 problems is that uh, when women have these problems, they will parent in abnormal ways. So there is this, they've had, they've had the, uh, they come from traumatised past themselves. And so, of course, we all understand borderline personality disorder now as the other name, complex trauma. So there's been trauma in their childhood, either at the macro level or sometimes more commonly at the repetitive micro level. Um, where their needs have not been met in their early childhood themselves. And because they've had that sort of compromised parenting, there will be that intergenerational transfer of problems which we're trying to break. So um, what types of problems are we talking about in the infant? We're talking about disrupted um, attachments, and so what we mean by that is that um, rather about 65% of infants can be categorised as securely attached, and obviously since I've got seven minutes to tell you how to cure these problems, we're not going to get to <laughs> be able to talk that much about it. But about 15% uh, of um, babies will have an insecure avoidant attachment, which is usually where their mother's been avoidant with them, and therefore 10% uh, will fall into the ambivalent category and laid over that can be the disorganised attachment that happens with the severe personality disorders and again I haven't got time to explain that now and so what we actually see are dysregulated infants who have problems with their feeding and sleeping patterns and who are clearly avoidant of their parents and how do we pick what's happening with the infants? We certainly pick it on the history that the mothers give the mothers generally know that things are not going well with their infants so they will tell us that, they'll say I'm Either my infant seems troubled, they won't use those words, but baby won't sleep at night. Sometimes they'll say things like, my baby hates me, which is pretty alarming. Or they might say, I don't love my baby like I ought. <clears throat> so we pick it from the history. We pick it from how the... Sorry, I forget to do both of these. Um, we pick it um, on how we observe the mother-infant relationship. And just a very simple scale for thinking about that is the, with the mnemonic fever. So what fever stands for is what's the facial expression of this baby? Is this baby smiling in an age-appropriate way? Does this infant eye gaze with the mother? Does this baby fix on us with the eyes or does the baby constantly look away? Will this baby vocalise? Does it chat away? Because often mums who are depressed and have personality related issues don't speak nearly enough to their babies. It's quite silent in the rooms and so when babies aren't spoken to they don't vocalise back. 
And so then the next A stands for activity, because normally for babies they should be moving around. You know how babies do like that? You know, so little babies kick, and then as they grow older, they convert that kind of generalised movement into very structured movement, as in they learn how to turn themselves over and to sit and to crawl and so on. But babies, particularly of depressed mums, often are much more still, and so that's the activity. And then R is the relationship to the examiner. Can this baby relate to me? What can I see when I'm with this baby? So fever is a good mnemonic to understand and structure how you're thinking about babies if you're not very used to working with mothers and babies. And how it's scored is, if you think the facial, rela um, facial expression is good, that's a zero, the same if the baby vocalises at zero. It's, then there's one, which is probably has this, and two is certainly has it. And if you get to two on any of these, so five times two is ten, so I'm good at arithmetic, you remember that. So, um, so the most that you can get to is ten, and um, if, you get to, if you get to two, then you should be asking for help from some, somewhere else. So what could you do about it all, the instant cure? So firstly, of course, learning, and of course in half an hour I can't possibly hope, even if I go two minutes over, I can't possibly hope to tell you more about it. We run a certificate course which is a 30 hour, 10 weeks times three hours on a Wednesday afternoon from three till six that costs $500. We're also going to start a perinatal one. So the infant one's about the infants and their mothers. The perinatal one is mainly about the mothers but with their infants. Um, so that's run in South Australia. It only gives you a Mickey Mouse certificate. It's a bit of a Mickey Mouse course which gives you wonderful knowledge but no particular um, qualification that's going to be that useful to you. And if you want to do that, contact Tammy Little at health.sa.gov.au or if you want to really learn further, the graduate diplomas that you can find more about on the Melbourne University or the New South Wales Institute of Psychiatry website are fantastic ways to go. And I can't recommend any of those courses strongly enough. So the next thing to mention is that when you're working with mothers and babies, really when you're working in mental health, you must have supervision. And I'm not talking about managerial supervision, about whether you've ticked the right timesheet. I'm talking about do you have someone that you can reflect with about these troubled families because they are troubled and they will bring up the troubles that we all have within us. And trust me, um, yesterday morning after our very successful conference that we've had this week, I came to work and we do have, um, you know, lots of... Um, women with lots of problems in Helen Mayo House, as always, and I sat there and I thought, oh my goodness, how will I do this? You know, because it's not, it's hard work that we do and we must have the opportunity um, to talk about it because that's um, one of the pathways, that one of the best pathways forward. So what can you do, just in general terms? Taking that supportive approach, understanding that she's coming from the best place that she can possibly have, uh, that she possibly is. So being there with her is the best thing that you can do in any form of therapy. The next thing to think about is providing her with simple information. Again, if you know about babies and you can provide, that's what development guidance is, you know what's appropriate. So sometimes mothers will, they can go either way with the developmental issues. They can be angry with their baby because they're not walking or not speaking at uh, nine months, let's say. You know, my baby's slow, I'm really troubled about my baby, where we can add absolutely normalise that and say, but that's completely normal. Some babies will have a few words at nine months or 12 months. Others, like my particular grandson, virtually didn't say his first word till he was two and now he's three, he's chattering away. So plenty of range of normal development. Other times we see the opposite, babies that are strapped in their pushchair uh, at 15 months and they're not walking and the reason they're not walking is because it's easier and safer for mum to trap her child in that um, pushchair all of the time and then she, has, she knows where that child is and doesn't have to kind of mind it, him, her in the same way and so because she does it that way we need to say your baby needs floor time, your baby needs to get out of that pushchair. So then the next thing, of course, is um, providing that therapeutic space, providing her with a forum to um, show her emotions and reflect for herself, and, of course, again, ensuring that she's got the best treatment that she can. And so depending on your skill level, it'll be providing that pathway to care yourself, but also making sure that she's keeping up mental health appointments if that's what she needs to be doing. And we know that lots of mums, we refer them to places from Helen Mayo and they don't go to them. So then there's... Um, 
I didn't have it up, did I? Sorry about that. You should have told me. Okay. Um, then there's um, there's various sorts of um, infant mother infant therapies, which I'm just going to mention, just to say, because of course. Um, uh, we're not going to be able to go into any detail about them, but just to say that there are lots of ways in which we're trying, ultimately most of these come down to, can we help this mother to reflect about her experience with her baby and her baby's experience with her? And so these are the names, there are more people learning more about um, infant mental health, and so we can kind of direct you towards some pathways to care. And again, just general pathways to care. Um, Going through um, the GP, if you're not sure if there's some query about diagnosis, you can ask GP to refer through GP PARSA, and the GP pa uh, GPs will know about GP PARSA. It stands for General Practice Psychiatric Assessment South Australia, and that's a pathway where GPs can get a private psychiatric assessment done as a one-off. Of course, you all know adult mental health services in the public sector. You're aware that I'm sure you know the NGO field much better than I do. Uh, Neil Underwood, who's one of our staff, runs a wonderful play group for, at Norwood um, for women who are struggling with their babies. And so it, the criteria to get in are that the woman has a mental illness and she has a baby under two that um, she needs to learn to interact and play with better. And that's run at uh, Norwood. And Maria Wigley, who's also another one of our staff, runs one down at uh, Port Nalunga in combination with Families SA. And again, the Through the Looking Glass, um, they run groups um, for women using the circle of security model, and there'll be more training in that. So, um, and then I've already mentioned my view about childcare. We need to make sure that the infant has their um, CAFs checkups so that they're meeting their developmental milestones and have their checkups in that way. And we're very, very clear that childcare, particularly the better childcares, offer great experiences for these kids if their mum's not doing it. And again, just another wonderful resource for children of parents with mental illness. The COPME website has some amazing information for um, infants. And so again, I can just point you in that direction. And that's, oop, that's it. <laughs> that was it. Only two minutes over time, which wasn't too bad, was it? So there we go. Um, and I said see you at our conference, but that, I don't know why I put that. I wrote this uh, before, and the co our conference is passed, so you have to come to the next one. It was very good this year. <laughs> Thank you.